great. So, I started by asking the same question this morning. Who of you can remember the days of building sand castles and digging tunnels in the sand? Did you ladies ever do that kind of thing? Okay. Great. Some of you are still doing it this afternoon. I can see by the dirt under your nails. Niku? Guilty. All right. All right, excellent. All right, so as Jones family, we have a saying, and some of you may know it, right? Some of you know it from this morning, all right? If you can't beat them, join them. No. If you can't beat them, destroy them, all right? Have you ever built a sandcastle, and the person in the sandcastle next to yours is better than yours? Or their tunnel is better than yours. And you just can't get it the same. Right? And there's that jealousy that rises up within your heart. And you just don't know what to do with this jealousy. But the only way to channel this energy that you have with inside of you is to go and destroy the other person's creation. And then you feel so good afterwards. I do that often with my children. I go build sand castles with them, and theirs usually looks better than mine. And when they turn around and I just wait for that moment, <laughs> oops, wasn't me. All right. There's that jealousy that rises up in our hearts, and we want to just block that tunnel. We want to just crush that tunnel right as they dig that masterpiece of theirs. Now, if you have a look at Genesis 21 through to Genesis 26, you'll see that Abraham was a master tunnel digger, right? He dug wells within the territory of the Philistines, within the territory of the enemy, right? He was so good at getting away with it. You dig it today, and before you know it, there it is, Oof. all right? He dug so many wells, and... Um, the, the enemy, the king Abimelech, was so intimidated by him because of the amount of wells that he dug. Now, how can that be? I dig a hole, now you're intimidated by me. I'm going to start digging holes around this church premises, and let's see. let's see if you're intimidated by me. Okay? So there's something significant about a well, and I just want to highlight some of these points for us tonight. Okay? So, wells were all about life, right? All about life. Where there was a well, there was life. Where there was a well, there were people. Where there was a well, there was livestock, all right? So, it brought about a sustainable life, okay? So, wells represented wealth and prosperity. If you owned a well, you were considered wealthy, Right? You were considered wealthy and prosperous if you owned a well. To own or possess a well spoke of independence. You weren't dependent on the system. You weren't dependent on the government of that time, on the rulership of that time. Right? You had your own supply. You could do your own thing. To own or possess a well... And a con was, uh, to own and possess a well and to own a country was synonymous. So what does that big sentence mean? To own a well or to possess a well was the equal to owning a country. So if I owned a well, it was almost the same as me owning South Africa. Right? Now, Abraham owned many wells in the land of the Philistines. So you must just understand how intimidated these people must be because you are so powerful. Owning a well is equal to owning a land of country. And here you own many wells in our land. You are independent. You are not dependent on us. 
You are not dependent on the system like all the other people. When you own the water, you own the people. You are not dependent on us. You are beyond us. You are more powerful. And here's something else that's significant that I want you to remember. A new well was a symbol of blessing and of being established. A new well was a symbol of blessing and of being established. Wells were also used as landmarks and named as reminders of specific occurrences. So if I dug a well, I would give it a name. Dig a well. Beautiful well. Right? If me and Mr. Akintola have an argument, I'm going to dig a well, I'm going to say, Akintola. Akintola well. And people will remember we had an argument at Akintola well. Right? Myself and John Dean, we dig a well. We have an argument. Okay, let's not argue about everything. What, what can we dig a well about? Okay, let's just argue about that. <laughs> okay. But there we go. We, we, we want to make peace because I was arguing with him. And now we have to have some form of peace in the land. So we make a, um, a treaty. All right. And we, what's your fun? <laughs> a well of canal. A canal of peace. This well is a canal of peace. Right, that's the name of the well. It doesn't sound too well. Okay. All right. So we would name the well and it would become landmarks and people would know what happened there, etc., etc. And people would travel to and fro from these wells. They were gathering spots. And another interesting thing, just by the way, that I didn't mention this morning. It seems like wells were places that you would pick up your wives. You would meet your woman. You would get jobs and get houses, all right? If you have a look at Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, Jacob and Moses, they, well, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses, they all met their wives at a well, and Jacob and Moses not only met their wives there, but they got jobs, they automatically got jobs with the, the wives and, and a household, right? So it's a, it's a benefit, it's a it's a pro, it's a, it's a benefit to, to find a well, okay? So, wells are good things. All right, so we see that in Genesis 21, Abraham had dug many of these wells in the land under this king Abimelech, and the king was intimidated by him. But now, Abraham is passed on, and Isaac steps into this inheritance. There were wells that were dug in the past that became an inheritance for the next generation. Right? An inheritance for the next generation. These are not only physical wells. All right? There were spiritual things that took place at these wells. So it's not only material inheritance. It's also spiritual inheritance. It's not only material inheritance. It's also spiritual inheritance. So what legacy are you going to leave for the next generation? Are you going to leave a material legacy or also a spiritual legacy? It was a transfer of legacy. Isaac prospered in the land and in Genesis 26 verse 12 to 13 and verse 14, we see that the people of the land became intimidated. They were intimidated by his father Abraham Father Abraham, uh, and now they've become intimidated by him. The same king, the same people, the same land, the same enemy have become intimidated. Why? Because of the transfer of legacy. Abraham was blessed in the land. Abraham had God's favor. Now that just transferred over to Isaac. That same favor, that same prosperity, that just transferred over to Isaac because he walked accurately. He walked accurately with Abraham. He honored, right? He walked accurately into legacy. 
And these people of the land were intimidated. They were envious. The Bible says they were envious of Isaac and his wealth. He had more servants. He had more uh, flocks than all the people there. All right? And I wrote you a little something. When your wells overflow, so will the envy in others grow. When your wells overflow, so will the envy in others grow. And this is not just in secular circles. This is not just in circles of unbelievers. Here they're talking about the Philistines, the enemies of the Hebrews, the enemies of the, the people of God. Okay? But even amongst the people of God, these things happen. When someone has favor. Just understand, these people were living in the land. King Abimelech was in the land before Abraham. Okay? Abraham was prospering more than him. Now his son comes, and now his son is prospering even more. Right? The servants are living there. The people are living there. They're not prospering like this. Okay? It's not just with them. But we find this with Christians as well, that when Christian people are prospering, Christian people are also being jealous and wondering why. Why them? Why not me? And these people start getting so envious that we want to shut down the blessing. We want to shut down the blessing. Have you ever experienced something like that before? You want to shut down the blessing of someone else? Or somebody else wants to shut down your blessing because of their envy? Right? Confession time. I've, I've shared about this before. But there's many times when I've rejoiced about the failures of others. Because I was jealous. And then they mess up and I'm like sitting there. <laughs> oh, so good. This feels so good, all right? When your wells overflow, so will the envy of others grow, all right? The next point, the enemy will try to shut down the wells of your inheritance and prosperity. In Genesis 26 verse 15, what they would do is they would take rocks and take sand and they would throw it in your wells to shut down the wells. And that's what they did to all the wells that Abraham had dug up. Right? This was the inheritance for Isaac in the land. So they go and they shut down all of his inheritance, all of his blessing, all of his favor, all of his prosperity in the land. And which also was symbolic of his power in the land. They come and they try and shut it down. All right? And in those days, if you read 2 Kings 3 verse 19 and 25, you will see that in those times, these were also warfare tactics. When you wanted to, uh, I can't get the English now, but it was warfare tactics. So what you would do is you would block the wells. If you're attacking a city, you would block the wells so that the people would... Um, be contained or whatever you want to call it in that city and start getting thirsty, start suffering, and they have to come out sometime, somewhere, someplace, and then you attack. And you take them out in the land. You take them out in the streets. They're weak. They're vulnerable. These were warfare tactics. If you want to demolish them, demolish their wells. All right? So the enemy comes, they want to destroy your power and your influence in the land, they want to destroy your fruitfulness in the land, they want to destroy your inheritance in the land, they want to discourage you in the land, right? They want to disconnect you from the stream of life so that they can destroy you. If they can disconnect you from the stream of life, they can destroy you. If the kingdom of darkness can disconnect you from the stream of life, they can destroy you. If they can distract you 
from the stream of life that can destroy you. In the beginning of lockdown, right, I, I shared this morning, I, I don't really um, watch TV. It's not really appealing to me, except for if you put sport on, then I can sit there all day long and watch sport. But then in the beginning of the lockdown, all of a sudden, I started watching a lot of TV, a lot of series. And man, Netflix was the bomb in the beginning of lockdown. And so was late, down, late night snacks. And then we suffered to get out of bed in the morning because it was easier just to roll out of bed. Right. And all of these things. And at night time is usually my time to read Bible, to connect with God. Myself and Esther would pray together. That, kind of, that was our time to do those kind of things. And that disappeared. This COVID lockdown thing kind of disconnected us from the stream of life. And it's so easy that technology can disconnect you. Disconnect you, steal your focus, take away your focus from the stream of life. Right? So what they would do is they would put blockages, throw stones in, all of these things in the wells. Right? So what are the blockages what do these blockages symbolize in our lives? Maybe bitterness, maybe judgment, maybe offense, discontent, hatred, envy, jealousy. What are those boulders, those rocks, that soil, that sand that wants to contaminate or block up your wells so that that stream of living water cannot flow. What is disconnecting you from the stream of life? So they say, you are too powerful for us. Please leave the land, right? They shut close what was once open and they evict him. They send him out, all right? So where, I, where Isaac was, where Isaac would dig, there was conflict. So on his way out, Right, he moved, he set up his tent, and there he would dig a well. And where he would dig a well, there these Philistines would come and they would oppose him. Right? There was conflict. Wherever he would dig, there was conflict. It was difficult to live in that land. Everything was such a struggle. Right? In this time, it's been such a struggle for people. It's been difficult for people. Right? But what they would do is they would name Right? They enjoyed naming these wells. Remember what I said. Right? Remember what I said. I'm going to get back there. I just, want to, I just want to say something before we get to the names. It's just in this time of conflict, he continued to dig. He didn't let opposition weigh him down. He didn't let opposition stop him from persevering. He continued to dig. Okay? It's easier to give up and to give in than to get up and get going. But Isaac was of a different mentality. He had a breakthrough mentality. He had a breakthrough mentality. And that is what you and I can have if we access who we are in Jesus Christ if we access the stream of life within us, if we remove all of these blockages and access that stream, right? Jehovah Perez, the God of the breakthrough, it has to, go, it has to do with water. Go research it, research it. All right, so where he digs, there's resistance. The first well that he dug after this whole episode, um, there was... There was verbal dispute, and they called it Essek. The next well that he um, dug, there was, there was opposition, all right? Even, even physical opposition, and they called it Sitna, which was physical opposition. The first one, Essek, which was dispute, verbal argument. And then they continued to dig. He didn't stop there. And the next well they dug, there was no opposition, there was no argument, and they called it Rehoboth room. God made room for us and established us. It is a new well. Remember what we said, a new well speaks of? New well speaks of? 
blessing and being established. Establishment. Okay? So, when you dig, the enemy might, might want to come and essek. They might want to come and argue and dispute. When you dig, the enemy might want to come and sit now. They want, might want to come and oppose you. It might be verbal opposition, physical opposition. But you need to persevere. You can't give up and give in. You need to get up and keep going. Because you will find your rear both. You will find that place where God has made room for you. And where he will establish you. So we went from there. He went to a place called Beersheba. And remember names. They called well certain names. Beersheba was a well. Once again. Who dug that well? His father Abraham. And at that well what happened? A treaty was made with King Abimelech. Between Abraham and King Abimelech. Right? But it wasn't just... A treaty at that well, Abraham called upon God. There was physical oath made, but there was also spiritual oath, spiritual connection in that place. It was a place of worship. It was a well of worship. So here he comes to this well at Beersheba, and automatically God rocks up, and he confirms his covenant with Isaac, the covenant that that he made with Abraham. He confirms it with Isaac. There was an open heaven in that place. Isaac didn't have to come and push in and call on the name of the Lord. Abraham had to do that. Isaac just walked into what Abraham had opened. What legacy are you leaving? What wells are you digging for the next generation? Are you just digging physical wells or are you digging spiritual wells? And what are you digging for yourself as well? Only physical or spiritual wells? So God confirms. Now, there's something that happens when God confirms his covenant with you. Right? When God confirms, uh, when, when God establishes an eternal ordinance, no one can dispute it. No one can oppose it. No one can block it, no one can shut it down, okay, not even lock it down, right, no one can lock down what he destined for you, okay, in verse 26 to verse 31, what happens is, this is now after the covenant, there's two things that take place here, the enemies come and make peace with Isaac, The covenant was re-established or confirmed. And after this, what happened? The enemies came and made peace. After this covenant was confirmed, there was another well that opened. We see at Rehoboth, there was an open heaven. We see at Rehoboth that the wells were just opening up. An open heaven, open ground. The, The wells were springing forth. After this covenant was made, the word of God, the plans of God, unshakable. No lockdown can lock down the plans of God for your life. Right? No lockdown can lock down the plans of God for your life. And what does he call this well, this new well that God opened? He calls it Sheba, which also speaks of oath, right? Also speaks of oath. But it's not only the well that he names. He names, he goes beyond just the well. He goes to name the town, the city, Beersheba, the place of oath, right? He didn't just name the well because it's no longer just about me and my encounter. It's about an encounter with a city. It's about a God encounter for a city. Right? It's no longer just about you. It's about the generations to come. It's about the people around you. Right? There's an open heaven above. There's springs of living water bursting forth below you. From above me, from below me, from before me, from behind me. 
God's favor all around me. This is what God has in store for you. In the season, no lockdown can lock down what God has destined for you. If wells are an inheritance, then what is the condition of the wells you have dug? What is the condition of the wells that you have received as an inheritance? What blockages or what is blocking the wells? What is hindering the streams of life? What are the intimidations in the land? The Essek, the arguments. What are the intimidations in the land? The Sitna, the oppositions. What is coming against you? What is coming against you? And what is your strategy? What is your strategy to persevere beyond this opposition? You cannot give up and give in. You've got to get up and get going. You've got to know the God of your father. You've got to recall his works and his ways. You've got to stand on his promises. You've got to deal with the blockages and you've got to persevere. Amen. May we take this, may we live it. And I'm going to ask Pastor Emil just to continue here for us. Thank you, Pastor Peter. Um, <clears throat> I said this morning, I want to say it again. Actually, you can just say amen to that and just go home. But I want to just leave you with three points. Um, I'm calling it the strategic battle plan. And it's um, FFP. Okay, it's, it's not a new party. It stands for flee, fight, and pursue. And um, I just want to read, if you want to, you can turn with me to 1 Timothy 6, verse 9 to 12. And this is advice being given to Timothy, a young man in, um, by his mentor, and I believe his spiritual father, uh, Paul. And he's writing this letter to Timothy, and he's just saying something very short. But it's something so powerful, and I want to share that with you. And, and I'm going to start reading from verse 6. It says, um, now godliness with contentment is great gain. It's 1 Timothy 6 from verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, and with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now we come to the, the part, the, the essence um, that I just want to highlight this evening. But it says, but you, O man of God, flee these things. So there's flee. And pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight, there's fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good Confession in the presence of many witnesses. Right. So, um, strategic battle plan. Um, I'm going to start with fight. All right. So, um, no, I'm not going to start with fight. I'm going to start with flee. Sorry. Okay, we need to flee these things. What things do we need to flee from? It says, temptation, okay, harmful lusts which drown men in destruction, the love of money, greediness, all right, we need to flee from these things, all right, so sometimes in our lives there are certain things, there are certain th um, things that block the well in our lives of that what God wants to come and do. And it's sometimes emotional, it's sometimes feelings, it's sometimes 
um, jealousy and hatred and uh, greediness. All these things that we can sometimes identify in our lives. Now, those things is blocking the well. And we need to flee from those things. That's a choice. All right? So, we're fleeing from, from certain things. And um, we're fighting to achieve other things. All right? So, in a battle, you flee when you, when you feel like you've, you've got to run now. Okay? And it's, and it's part of the battle plan to flee, but there's also the second part, to fight. All right? Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many, of many witnesses. And that is here where we um, must realize that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. The struggle sometimes is, it seems, it seems physical, but it's not. It's spiritual. All right? It says in James um, chapter 4, verse 7 to 8, Therefore, submit to God. Resist. Now, this is fighting, giving resistance. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your, you ha your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. All right, it's important that we must remember that when we fight, we don't fight the person. All right, our struggle is against, um, against in, uh, the spiritual rulers of darkness. It says um, in Ephesians 6 verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in the heavenly places. So our fight is not against people. All right. And sometimes we flee and fight in battle. Even in relationships. Sometimes we flee and fight. And we flee and fight even in our, in our relationship. With people and those around us. And, and that is wearing us out. That is wearing us out. To run away and, and, and to fight. It, it wears us out. But I want to just highlight the third one. Pursue. And um, it says here that pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Now that is a whole sermon on its own. But um, I just want to, to, to highlight a couple of things of... Uh, to pursue, and I want to ask a question, what are you pursuing? Because I believe that in, in this pursuing of righteousness, our pursuing is that thing that keeps us connected. Remember, Pastor Peter now spoke about, you know, how we can become disconnected. Okay, and sometimes we're so busy fleeing and fighting that we become disconnected. That's why we need to pursue. Pursue and grab hold of. All right? It says that um, I ask myself the question, what am I pursuing? And um, it says here, in, um, when, when Paul writes to Timothy, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love. And when I read love, a little bell went off in my head and I... And I thought about, I know about love. You know, there's a whole um, book about that or a whole chapter about that in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 13, and I quickly paged there. And um, I thought, okay, I'll just read a bit about love. Okay, that which I must pursue in the midst of fleeing and fighting. I must pursue this. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely. Okay, there I already knelt it out in prayer and um, did some repentance. Does not seek its own, is not provoked. My goodness, there I had to kneel down again. Thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. 
that is what I must pursue for me not to become disconnected. Because I'm so busy fighting the enemy and sometimes fleeing from the evil things of the enemy and the lusts and the things, but I sometimes forget to pursue. Who of you that are sitting here? Okay, not, not many of you, but who is married? All right? And when I speak about this, you know, you pursue the, the guy or the girl of your dreams. You pursue them. All right? And then you get married. And then you turn over to the fighting and fleeing part. I, I'm not, not always. But sometimes in a marriage, it's only fighting and fleeing. It's not pursuing one another because you're married now. But that's where we're wrong. In our walk, in our Christian walk, sometimes when we fight and we pursue and then, you know, it was a battle, but I gave my heart to the Lord and, you know, I'm Christian now and, you know, we forget to pursue. Pursue love. Reach for that. Pursue more of that. Because when we pursue these things, Kindness, not to envy others, not to parade ourselves, not to be puffed up. When we pursue, not to behave rudely and not to be provoked. When we pursue the truth, when we pursue love, we will be able to bear all things. Our hope will be there. We will be able to endure. And um, this is something that the Lord really spoke to me about. Because sometimes we, f we forget these things. We can fight and we can flee. But we forget to pursue and grab hold of that what God has for us. I want to read... Uh, a scripture in Philippians 3 verse 12, it says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold. Everybody just do this. Okay? Laying hold. Okay? That I may lay hold of that which Christ has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Sometimes we're so busy fighting and fleeing that we forget to pursue, we forget that intimacy, just to have intimacy. In our relationship with God. And I wrote something here. And it was quite a revelation to me. But I'm sure you've heard it. I always get into trouble. With getting fresh revelations. And then pastor said. Oh, but I've preached about that. Where were you? Intimacy brings peace. Intimacy brings peace. And it's not the peace that the world can give us. Intimacy brings peace. I just want to. Um, read three more, three more scriptures. And um, the one is in uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 6, verse 12, where this one king wanted to uh, set a trap for the king of Israel, but the man of God warned the king of Israel repeatedly, not, not once, not twice, but more than that, warned him, do not go there. Go another way, because he heard from God where the enemies were. And this king grew so um, tired of not being able to get hold of the, 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 the king of Israel, he thought he had a spy in his midst. And he called his people and he said, who of you is telling the, the king what our battle plans are? Because he always goes another way. 
And then one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So intimacy brings that peace. Intimacy brings strategy to avoid fighting and fleeing the whole time. Now, I'm not saying you should never fight or you should never flee. Okay? Um, Joseph had to flee from Potiphar's wife. Okay? He didn't fight there. He just ran. He fled. But it was because of his intimacy. It was because that he, the reason was that he pursued that what God had for him. And that's when he knew when to flee and when to fight. So my question to you tonight is, what are you pursuing? Maybe you're sitting here tonight and you are tired. It feels like you're fighting all the time, fighting with yourself, fighting against Desires that you know that is not of God. Fighting against things in your life. You have certain struggles. Maybe you're just running. You're tired of fleeing all the time. You know you're just running from all these things. Or you're tired of fighting all these things. And I want to encourage you tonight and to say. Come to a place where in the midst of all these things. You start pursuing. That what God has for you. To run and take hold of that what God has for you. It's in pursuing God that I am able to leave a legacy for my children to walk in. If I get the victory like Abraham dug the wells, Isaac could just walk into that. And I'm trusting the Lord that my, that my children and their children, that I will leave a legacy for them to just walk into. That I do so much pursuing that they can just walk into that intimacy with Father God. And then scripture that pastor spoke about, um, I think last Sunday, Jeremiah 33 verse 3. And this is also a thing of pursuing, calling out to God. Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. But sometimes we're so busy fighting and fleeing, we're not calling. We are not hearing and just spending that time pursuing that what God has for us. And um, just the last scripture that I want to end off with is in Proverbs 16, verse 7. This is so powerful for me. And I hope it carries the same power for you in the situation where you are right now. It says, when a man's ways please the Lord... He makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. Now take this as you want to take it. But um, sometimes we just need to pursue what God has for us. Then there will be less fights. There will be less fleeing. We need to pursue. And I want to end off by saying, Let's pursue peace. Let's pursue intimacy with God so that that peace that God gives that transcends all understanding can be our part this evening. Let's just close our eyes. Father God, thank you that we can come to you this evening, Lord, and thank you, Father, for your awesome word that spoke to us about how the enemy wants to come and Steal, how the enemy wants to come and fight dirty by throwing sand and stones and blocking our wells of living water. And Father, I want to pray for everyone that's sitting here tonight that, that feels that there is a blockage in my life. There's something that happened that, that, that blocked the streams of living water. There's something that caused me to stop pursuing my first love. There are things that I am pursuing that is not godly. Father and I want to come before you this evening and I am praying for my brothers and my sisters and myself as well, Lord. We just want to say, here we are. 
Father God, we want to pursue you like never before. We want that intimacy with you like never before. Father, I pray that the wells of living water will just burst forth, burst open. Father, what en- whatever the enemy plugged it with in the past, whatever the enemy that, that hope uh, lost, that despair, that jealousy, that envy, um, that greediness, or whatever the enemy came, that disappointment to block our wells with, I pray that you will uproot it tonight in Jesus' name. I pray, Father God, if we had identify those things tonight, that we will also trust you for the breakthrough and that we will not give up hope, but that we will re, uh, reopen uh, those wells. That we will start digging. And Father, thank you that your word says that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. Thank you that if we're digging these wells, we're not digging it alone. We're not digging it ourselves. We're digging with you. And I pray, Father God, that you will come and touch us through through your Holy Spirit this evening. That we will just be aware of your presence. That we will be aware of our need to pursue you like never before. To hear what your mandate is and to, to run with that, Father God. I pray for everybody that is tired and weary of fighting and fleeing. And I pray, Father God, that they will seek you and that they will find rest for their souls. I pray that they will, that they will act upon your invitation in your word which says, that says, come to me all who are thirsty. I pray that you break open that scripture to them, that they understand. Lord, I pray that you unveil our eyes to understand the invitation that you are giving us tonight. And we just want to declare, we hunger and thirst for more of you this evening, Father God. I pray that you will come and touch every life. And even in this week lying ahead, Father God, that we will not grow tired of doing good, Father, that we will that we will start digging with you. Thank you, Father, that we know that if you start something, you will finish it. And thank you that we can be excited to see more of you in our lives. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.